In the movie Congo, a group of explorers venture into the Virunga region of the Congolian rainforest looking for the lost city of Zinch. Deep in the uncharted jungle, it's rumored the city holds unimaginable wealth. Hundreds of explorers have set out to find this treasure, all of them failing. While Westerners chalk up these failures to lack of experience and preparation, local tribesmen know the real reason. Something sinister guards the city of Zinch. It's the reason expeditions don't just fail, they vanish without a trace. This expedition is well aware of the rumors. They're better prepared, better armed, and more experienced than any who have gone before them. If anyone has a chance of finding the city, it's them. If you were a member of their expedition, do you think you'd survive? Do you think you'd make it through a war-torn country where cannibalistic warlords are the least of your concerns? And if so, do you think you'd survive the sinister threat waiting for you at your ultimate destination? You do? Well, you're wrong. I'm here to tell you why. Even with your well-armed expedition and badass guide, none of you are going to make it back. What do you mean? Like, not on the same flight? In this video from Strange Thoughts, I'll cover the top 10 reasons you won't survive the primal threat waiting for you deep in the jungles of the Congo. However, before I get to all the reasons your life will come to a school crushing end, hit the like and subscribe button. And do it now, because most of you won't even make it past the first checkpoint. Our analysis starts in the mountainous region of the Congo. Here we see the latest in a long list of doomed expeditions making their way into the rainforest. This particular expedition is being funded by the telecommunications giant, Travicom. Their interest isn't in the city, but the rare blue diamond rumored to be located somewhere in its vicinity. With this diamond, Travicom can build a laser that will revolutionize telecommunications for years to come. Back at the Houston base headquarters for Travicom, we're introduced to Karen Ross, the special projects lead, and JB Travis, the CEO. It's been eight hours since the last check-in and they're anxiously awaiting good news. When the expedition doesn't contact them at the agreed upon time, Karen activates the camera remotely. When the video feed comes online, they see an empty camp. Weird. Paying the camera to catch someone's attention, the corpses come into view. What in God's name? These guys got fucked up. Brains are everywhere, eyes are missing, and limbs are strewn about. This wasn't the doing of other humans. Even the most brutal warlords aren't capable of this carnage. This group either stumbled into the hunting grounds of an interstellar predator or encountered the evil force rumored to be guarding the region. As they're taking this in, something quickly crosses the screen. The camera pans again at a different angle, but is attacked before they can get a good look at it. They're left dumbfounded. Reviewing the tape, they count seven dead. While they can't be sure the weren't more bodies out of view, there is the possibility some made it out alive. If those survivors are to have any chance, they need to be rescued. Karen pulls up their contingency plan. Carefully drawn up for situations like this, it clearly states that if one expedition mysteriously disappears, the company should send another to follow in their exact footsteps. It's time to fly down there and give this another go. While they're booking their flights, we're introduced to Amy the Gorilla at the UC Berkeley Gorilla Research Lab. At a young age, Amy was displaced from her family who lived deep in the Congo rainforest. Now an adolescent, she's the focus of a program aimed at establishing communication between humans and primates. She's smart and incredibly cute. As Amy finishes up the latest in her series of foreboding jungle paintings, Dr. Peter Elliott, the head of the program, comes in the front door. It's time to show her off to an audience of potential donors that can help further fund his research. Dr. Elliott's presentation starts with a jaw-dropping example of the progress he's made teaching Amy how to communicate. Peter. Hello. Peter. Amy. Good. Gorilla. I want one. Dr. Elliot not only taught her sign language, but developed a device to translate her gestures into the cutest robot voice since Short Circuit. While all the donors are mesmerized, one in particular stands out from the rest. As he sits there, his gaze shifts to a ring in his hand, a ring with the same ominous looking eye from Amy's paintings. That night, Amy has a nightmare. This is the latest in a series of bad dreams that have haunted Amy for the last week. Elliot's concerned and confused as to what could be bringing on such nightmares. Looking around her room, he searches for clues. One by one, he examines the paintings. Creepy eye, jungle portrait. Ominous eye, jungle portrait, and so on in repeated fashion that canvas the wall. The only reasonable conclusion is that Amy wants to go home. That, and she's been watching too much trash TV about Freemason conspiracy theories. The next day, he sets out to request the money necessary to send Amy to the Congo. Unfortunately, he learns any available funding would seek to keep her here, not return her home. That's when resident creep Tim Curry shows up and offers to fully fund such an expedition. I will pay. I will pay 
for Emmy to go home. He introduces himself as Herkimer Homolka, a Romanian philanthropist traveling the world and doing good deeds. What a nice guy. I'm sure he's trustworthy and doesn't have any ulterior motives. The group rendezvous at the airport where Karen, the Travicom employee, just so happens to show up. Turns out she needs a cover story to enter the Congo. Local authorities are cracking down on US corporate intervention and her little story about monkeys mauling her company's expedition isn't gonna fly. That excuse may have worked the first 10 times, but they're catching on to American deception. Her only way to make it into the country is this science expedition. When she pleads to be added to the plane's manifest, Dr. Elliot refuses. That is, until he realizes Hermaker came up a little short on gas money and they need some financial help. Unfortunately, there has been a slight interruption in my credit flow. I am unable to pay for the fuel. Elliot has no other choice but to accept her help. Little does he know, this funding isn't coming from Travicom, at least not directly. Reason 1. Your mission's now being funded by the CIA. In the film and the book it's based on, Karen said to have spent 15 years working for the Central Intelligence Agency before leaving to work at Travicom. The thing is, there's no such thing as a former CIA agent. While her business card may read Travicom, her true employer is still the United States intelligence community. This expedition's now being indirectly sponsored by one of the shadiest organizations in the United States. Whether or not this is a problem depends on their motive. Motives. It could be that Karen's superiors actually want to find the diamond, which just so happens to be located next to Amy's home. In that case, CIA sponsorship may even help. But let's take a look at the CIA's actual history in the region and chart a more realistic course to your demise. A simple Google search is all you need to know the CIA has a long history of meddling in Africa. From simple gun running all the way to assassination attempts, we've done our best to sow some serious distrust among local governments. Now let's pivot back to you. Whether or not you like it, as a member of this expedition, you're now associated with the CIA. If Karen is following in the footsteps of her predecessors, she's likely doing something a little shadier than tracking down a diamond. If her mission gets discovered, the dangers awaiting for you at the Lost City of Zinj will be the least of your concerns. But we'll assume the CIA wasn't there to influence local politics, buying you enough time to make it to the next life and death situation. The plane touches down and the crew get their first taste of Africa just moments after arriving. Oh, oh, shit, now. That was the president's car. The crew pull up next to their guide slash gun runner Monroe, who tells them a civil war is about to erupt. When Karen asks how bad this is for them, he gives it to her straight. Whenever the leadership of one of these little central African countries comes into question, they tend to just murder everybody. But surely they'll spare Americans, right? No, you're in even more danger. Let me introduce you to reason number two why you won't survive. Wars cost money. Civil wars like the one you are now a part of are expensive. Rebel leaders know this, and they have found many new revenue streams to fund their operations. One of these revenue streams is ransoming Westerners. This is just one of the reasons Africa has one of the highest concentrations of countries on the Department of State's do not travel list. The going rate for an American is around $500,000, and the threat behind late payments is constantly reaffirmed. If you travel into one of these regions known for this type of crime, you better be sneaky. If you get kidnapped, you'll be sorely disappointed when the Kickstarter created to free you comes up $475,000 short. As days tick by, fantasies of a SEAL Team 6 rescue will be replaced with the reality of the United States' stance on terrorism. We don't negotiate with terrorists. Good thing for you, the CIA has a lot of money and Karen is able to bribe a safe passage to the Tanzania border. There the expedition prepares to board a plane that will take them across the border to neighboring Zaire. An assortment of crates containing food, parachutes, and heavy weaponry are loaded on the plane. At this point it should be clear you're no longer on a science expedition. You're either launching a coup or taking on King Kong. Reason 3. I'll give you 50-50 odds. The expedition has barely crossed the border into Zaire when explosions start rocking the plane. Monroe informs Dr. Elliot the expedition is violating Zaire airspace and their aircraft has been targeted. As if this was all part of the plan, he throws the doctor a parachute. Elliot starts hastily preparing for his first freefall while Karen and Moreau activate the plane's sophisticated countermeasures. The Zaire Air Force has moved to heat seekers and they need to buy the group some time. I really 
wanted to call BS on this strategy. Using flare guns to fend off heat-seeking missiles just seemed too Hollywood. But after a little research, it turns out this could work. With the right combination of early model heat seekers, favorable approach vectors, and flare gun sharpshooters, this crew could slip past the Zaire Air Force. Again, it's not foolproof, but it could work. However, even if all these favorable factors align, you're still not in the clear. Reason 4. They didn't forget about you. In the movie, the expedition is seen safely floating into the jungle below. When they land, the group starts slowly collecting their gear, preparing for their trek into the forest. No one is panicking or in a hurry. The group consensus seems to be that they're no longer in danger. After all, it's not like the Zaire army would waste the gas money to come track them down. Or would they? Let's consider this from the Zaire military's point of view. They're in the middle of a war, with rebels rumored to be working with the CIA. A plane just crossed into their airspace, disregarding all commands to avert course. Before they were able to shoot it down, a succession of parachutes accompanied by heavy-duty gear crates exited the plane. While the Zaire military knows nothing about your science expedition, they have heard plenty of rumors about rebels sneaking behind front lines to engage in guerrilla warfare. In their minds, 20 well-armed commandos just landed 20 miles behind where they'll be sleeping tonight. If they don't find these rebels before sunset, they may not wake up tomorrow morning. They're going to set upon your expedition with fury. They'll be redlining those jeeps as they travel 20 miles down the road to your last known location. It's safe to say they'll have a shoe first, ask questions later approach to your capture. If they find you, they'll take one look at your well-armed expedition and assume you're the rebels they're looking for. They'll hurl everything they have at you and your team until there's nothing left. But we'll assume the Zaire military got lost along their way, allowing you and the rest of the expedition to lollygag your way into the forest. That evening, after making it to the first predetermined campsite, Karen places a call to Travicom headquarters in Houston. There she checks in with CO Travis, telling him the expedition has made it to the bottom of the mountain. Travis is pleased to hear it and shares the latest intel he's gathered on the fate of the first expedition. It turns out, Travicom has a primatologist on the payroll who's able to analyze the creature they saw in the initial uplink. My primatologist tells me it's something new. He doesn't know what it is, but it's gorilla-like. Well, that's not great. Any good news? The bad news is geothermal. Region's going to blow. Could be a week, could be okay, so let me make sure I'm tracking here. A new species of vicious gorillas await us at a volcano that could explode at any moment. Thanks for checking in, boss. We'll let you know how it goes. The next morning, the expedition is greeted by two members of the Mizumu Ghost Tribe. They explain they found an unconscious white man in the forest with a symbol on his clothing matching the Travicom logo. The group make their way to the village where they find Bob Driscoll, one of the initial expedition members. They set him upright and begin waking him up right in front of Amy. While lovable teddy bear to those who know her, Amy is a gorilla and Bob just saw his entire expedition brutally murdered by gorillas. In their haste to wake Bob from his nightmares, they're quickly bringing us to reason number five why you wouldn't survive. You were scared to death. When Bob comes to his senses in front of Amy, he loses it. The mere sight of the gorilla releases toxic levels of adrenaline, causing him to die in seconds. Now you the viewer may think you're immune to such a fate. After all, your steady diet of horror movies and live leak footage have desensitized you to just about everything. That's where you're wrong. Nothing you've ever experienced can compare to what Bob lived through. He saw his entire expedition reduced to limbless torsos by ape-like creatures who seemed to enjoy their work. The psychological stress from an event like this rewires brains. It sets up a self-destruct mode activated by any stimulus similar to the initial event. Unless you're harder than David Goggins, you're gonna react just like Bob. Reason 6. Hungry Hungry Hippo After burying Bob, the group embark down a river that will take them to the final leg of their journey. A day of hard paddling pays off, and by nightfall they reach a moonlit lake at the base of the mountain. Gliding along the tranquil water, the porters pull out flashlights. They're looking for something in this lake, and from the look of their faces, it's dangerous. As you start wondering what may be eyeing you from beneath, you feel something bump the bottom of your boat. That was no fish. Moments pass until you see bubbles approaching from your right. All you can think about is scenes from countless horror flicks of giant alligators, snakes, and squids. You know these are all fictional, but you can't shake the feeling that if they were to exist, they'd be in this nameless lake. That's when it attacks. <laughs> 
5,000 pound hippo emerges from the water, ripping into your raft, causing two members to fall in the murky water. Luckily, gunfire and flares quickly scare it off before it can do any more damage. You're able to make it to shore with nothing more than a few bad cuts. And that's what a PG-13 hippo attack looks like. An accurate portrayal would have pushed this film well into the rated R territory. Why? Because hippos are vicious. Each year they kill twice as many people as lions, making them the deadliest of all land mammals. Around 500 a year die in these incidents, with many more maimed for life. With this in mind, let's give this scene the rated R revisions it deserves. First, hippos, plural, travel in pods of 10 to 30. This means you'll likely be dealing with more than just one. When these 5 ton beasts attack, they'll fling your rafts into the air like play toys. In the ensuing chaos, those in boats will ditch the guns to paddle for shore, and those in the water will desperately try to catch up. If you're a slow swimmer or just so happen to be right next to a hippo, your screams will be hushed as they drag you into the depths below. Your great adventure will come to an end as you wonder why the hell this vicious beast was the inspiration for a children's board game. But let's get back to the movie narrative. Even if Hollywood and I differ on the outcome of this scene, we do agree on the next few reasons you won't make it. After the previous night's exciting boat ride, the expedition is back on dry land. When they come to what appears to be a wall of some sort, Amy encourages them to push through. Machete go to work slicing through thick foliage until you see it. The lost city of Zinge. Hermic or Homolka was right. It does exist. It doesn't take long before the group notices some trash on the ground. If the remaining members of the first expedition are still alive, they're somewhere in this city. It's decided the majority of the group will search the dark catacombs while a small contingent will stay outside with Amy. The search party wanders into the temple gazing upon hieroglyphics and calling out for the lost explorers. When their search comes up short, they make their way back out to find the mauled bodies of those who stayed outside. Whatever dark force attacked the first expedition is now feeding on yours. It's time to get the fuck out. Reason 7. You didn't get the fuck out. Whether due to greed or a selfless commitment to find the lost explorers, your crew decides to spend the night inside Murder City. The expedition goes to work setting up perimeter alarms and sentry machine guns. I'm glad those come with a danger sticker. The last thing you want is someone thinking they're a toy. That night, as the group is roasting wieners, reading up on hieroglyphics, and fondling their pistols, one of the sentry guns goes off. <laughs> Everyone looks into the jungle, but the thick foliage hides any signs of the attackers. Seconds later, more sentry guns go off. God, those things are cool. I'll take one talking gorilla and ten of those sentry guns, please. Hitting the floodlights, they make out the shapes of killer apes moving just out of range of the sensors. Popping in here and there, you realize what they're doing. They're testing their perimeter. Karen opens up the motion tracker and sees they're preparing for an attack. As they run at the weak point of the defenses, she directs all firepower in their direction. Sentry guns, rifles, and shotguns send a barrage of bullets towards the attackers, killing some and scaring off the rest. Her quick thinking saves the expedition from almost certain death. After a few minutes of silence, trigger fingers loosen. It seems like the killer apes are done, at least for now. Hermaker comes out of his tent announcing he translated the hieroglyphics they found from earlier. We are watching you. This would make sense given recent events. Only eight more hours until sunlight. Hopefully those machine pistols don't run out of ammo. The next morning, they find two porters missing. While it should be clear to everyone that missing equals dead in this jungle, Monroe wants to go after them. His six years working with the SAS instilled in him a duty to never abandon his brothers in arms, even if there is a 99.99% .99 chance they're dead. Reason number eight, the leave no man behind policy. While heroic, this saying just doesn't apply to the current situation. No one ventured off on their own to find a better place to poop. If they're gone, it's because the killer apes took them back for dinner. Monroe's courageous actions are just going to get more of this expedition killed. Wandering back into the complex, the group come across more signs that they should have left this place a long time ago. Drawings tell the story of how these gorillas were bred for violence to guard the mine. When they turned on their masters, everyone was killed, except for the guy writing the hieroglyphs. He somehow made it long enough to carve this into the wall. As they make their way through dark hallways, the walls shake, reminding them they're on the top of a very active volcano. Eventually, they find their way into the diamond mine. Once again, you can't believe the rumor was true. Precious gems litter the sandy ground, each worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. All that stands between you and a Dan Blazarian lifestyle is 100 killer apes who quietly emerged from the walls. 
You're down to seven men, each with only a couple spare mags. You won't be able to hold them off for long. You start scrambling looking for a way out when Karen comes across Charlie, the missing member of the first expedition. In his hand, he holds the largest, rarest blue diamond the world has ever seen. Karen tells you to buy her two minutes while she pulls a satellite uplink out of her pack. The crystal's all she needs to turn the latest in portable telecommunication into a Spartan laser. She goes to work slicing and dicing monkeys, paving a path for the exit right as giant fish open up. The volcano is about to erupt. Reason 9. You aren't outrunning a pyroclastic flow. Monroe, Elliot, and Karen are the only ones left at this point. Making it out of the mine, they run, jump, and climb their way to safety. After five minutes of hard sprinting, they're in the clear, wrapping up the most unrealistic scene in this entire movie. You see, pyroclastic flows like the one in this film move fast. A stratovolcano like the one in this movie is going to blow with the force of a thousand atabombs sending a wave of mud, lava, and toxic chemicals down that mountain at speeds of up to 400 miles per hour. If you find yourself in such a situation, you're not going to make it. Unless you conveniently stumble upon a hot air balloon. Nice. As you sail off into the wind, you see Amy below. Dr. Elliot smiles. It was all worth it. Yes, 20 good men died horrible deaths, but this gorilla now has a family. Mission accomplished. And that's where our analysis... Wait, wait, I forgot about something. What was it? Oh yeah, the Zaire Air Force. As you float back over their camp at a steady 4 to 6 miles per hour, you'll make for great target practice. Unless Karen brought her box of flares, those missiles are going to bring your adventure to an explosive conclusion. And that's where our analysis comes to an end. If you still think you would have made it, you're either delusional or Dutch Schaefer. I mean, he took on an interstellar warrior. I think he can handle some smart apes. I hope you liked my glass half empty analysis of why you wouldn't survive the movie Congo. If you'd like me expand your survival chances in other horror movie scenarios, consider subscribing as it helps me make more videos. Thanks for watching. Remember that most African safaris are nowhere near this dangerous, unless they involve searching for a lost city, in which case you're going to die. <laughs>